How many people happen to be in the house of the Lord this morning? God is truly good. So today we're in the third. By the way, I'm Pastor Paul. If you didn't know. Today we're in the third part of a five-part series on winning 2024. And we're going to be speaking on being the pacemaker. Are you hearing me all right? I used to hold a mic, so I, I kind of control my feet. But I have a step up, by the way. <laughs> and I have earpiece now. <clears throat> Specifically, we're going to be talking about the company we keep. As a body of believers, we are called to be pace setters. And a pace setter, by definition, means that you set the pace and others look on and follow you. So pace setters, as a body of believers, we are called to be pace setters. And we're following in our Lord Jesus' footsteps. Now, anybody who knows me know that I love sports. My wife knows not to call me when sports are on. Because somehow I can't hear her. <laughs> so I'm a lover of sports and almost every sport. But I have a great love for track and field and athletics. So when I was asked to speak about being a pace setter, of course, my mind goes to athletics. Now, in athletics, there is usually a pace setter in some of the long distance races. And that's the person who everybody is trying to keep up with. So we see pace setting a lot among African nations. So when you watch the 5,000 meters, or the 10,000 meters, you see a lot of that, even in the marathon races. And I like to watch the Kenyans and the Ethiopians. And what usually happens is that the country, let's just say Ethiopia, they have at least two runners in the race. And throughout the race, each of these runners take turns in setting the pace for a period of the race. They go out in front, and sometimes you'll even see them calling their colleague to come along, keep pace with me, keep pace with me. And they do this to ensure that they both finish the race. And they give each other the best opportunity to be among the medals and to be winners. So as children of God, we need to follow the footsteps of our Lord. The Lord is calling us and we need to keep pace with him. And we, in turn, as pace setters, need to be setting the pace for others to follow us. So people should be following us as we follow Christ. Amen? Amen. However, to strive for excellence, we must establish healthy relationships with other people. Now, God designed us as social beings with a natural inclination towards meaningful connections with others. And it's only through these connections and these relationships that we can live the life that God intended for us. To win in 2024, we need the right people to help us make it. So back to the race now. Ethiopians are running together for the benefit it gives each of them. Now they're both running to win the race, you know. But as a team, they pace each other. In the final lap, all bets are off. May I run for win? But te they tend to always end up coming first, second, or third because they run together as a team. <clears throat> Proverbs 27 and verse 17 says, You use steel to sharpen steel, and one friend sharpens another. In the same way, if you are to win in 2024, you need a right team to run with. The right relationships are designed for our benefit. The people you spend the most time with shape who you are. 
We can't say that often enough. Eventually, you start to think like they think and behave like they behave. As Darren Hardy writes, according to research by social psychologist Dr. David McClellan of Harvard, the people you habitually associate with determine as much as 95% of your success or failure in life. So yes, we want to win in 2024, but who we have around us will determine if we win and the areas in which we will win. So you have to ask yourself the question, am I hanging with the right people? Now you might say, I want to win in my marriage. Well, are you hanging with people with a good marriage? I want to be stronger financially. Are you hanging with people who understand how to manage money? I want to be stronger spiritually. I want to advance professionally. The Bible states in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 12, that two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So let's now take a look at five winning benefits of friendship. And the first one is friendship is a good investment. When the author says in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Good return means good dividends paid on a wise investment. The very best investment you will ever make in life will not be a financial one, but rather the investment made in the right relationships. It is encouraging to work alongside a friend. We get energy and we support our friendships. But too often in life we approach things with an individualistic mindset. We think we need to accomplish things on our own and not seek help. Anybody like that in the room? Don't put up your hand. <laughs> I suspect everybody might put up their hand. The problem is that when we operate that way, we get burnt out. We get overwhelmed and we get frustrated. What we can do together is much more than we can do apart. The philosopher Aristotle said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Meaning that together we can achieve more than we would do individually by ourselves. So I have a story to tell. Back in the day, my brethren and I used to run boat. I don't know about run boat. What run boat mean? <laughs> in the summers, we used to come together and cook. The problem was, my mother left me at home to stay at home and not leave the yard. But as the car turned the corner, we never had telephones in those days. So we used to shout. So I would have a shout and say, Peter, you come. Ian, where are you there? And we'd all come together to cook. We all love our bellies. So somebody would be cooking aki, and not a stripping saltfish. No, I determine the menu, right? Because it's my yard. <laughs> and I love aki and saltfish. And somebody, on odd moments when there was ham, somebody slicing the ham, and another one mixing the juice. 
all hands on deck. Remember now that after all these activities, the kitchen needs to be spick and span. Because we're not allowed to do any chefing. Nor were we to have a house full of people. My mother is no longer here, so I can confess. <laughs> At times, we had a whole football team in my house cooking. But many hands made light work. So the house got tidied and all evidence erased. And I couldn't do all that by myself. Amen? So on this particular day, I remember delegating a friend to cut my mother's ham. Now, I should have checked out his credentials before because that requires skillful work. The slices can't be too thin, but just enough that it won't be noticed. And after I see him do the first slice, which was a steak size slice, <laughs> I had to take him off that duty, eh? I had to relegate him to utilize his skills elsewhere. So the joint effort was in making a meal together in the quickest way possible and cleaning up before my mom got home. Now, let me just make it very clear. If we have negative teammates, that can cost you the entire race. Proverbs 18 and verse 24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And this world that we live in has a whole range of negative teammates and a whole range of negative friendships. Now I had a friend who fell in love with a very beautiful woman. The problem was that all the friends could see that beyond the beauty was a negative, shallow, and vindictive person. No, the friend had to make a choice, and the friend severed some very good friendships just to be with that woman. And after many years when she was done with him, he was a shadow of himself. And she later went on to damage other hearts and other lives. So in this life, negative teammates, negative friendships can wreck your life. They can sabotage you. They can shift your focus and hamstring your purpose. They can drain your spirit. Anybody know about draining spirit? Yes. Is that Jamaican thing that? I don't know if the foreigners listening online or overseas understand drain your spirit. You know what I'm about? Yes. All right. They can make the environment toxic. And they can be wolves in sheep's clothing. Proverbs 12 and verse 26 says, The righteous choose their friends carefully. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. The truth is, forming good friendships can be difficult in our fast-paced, social media-driven world. But positive friendships are the best return, is the best return on that investment over any other investment that we will ever make. <clears throat> Psychology Today website states that friendships make us happy. Friendships help us find ourselves and we find enjoyment in life. Friendships often help to give our lives purpose. And friendships help to bring satisfaction to our lives. Now an Australian researcher, research concluded that people who have good friends live 22% longer than people who don't. I don't know any medication that give you that promise. But if you find a good friend, you're on the right track to living longer. Having the right persons or the right friends around you is important. Why then is it difficult 
for some people to develop genuine friendships. And the reason could be friendship requires a lot of intentional, continuous effort. Building relationships demands sacrifice and risk and can be complicated, it can be uncomfortable, and it can be inconvenient. However, the main reason that often holds us back from forming real relationships is fear. Relationships involve being vulnerable. However, it's one of the keys to winning. Two are better than one, the scripture says, because they have a good reward for their labor. Again, a good friendship is the best investment you will ever make in life. For our own sake, we must decide to focus on building positive relationships. However, as Proverbs 18 and verse 24 says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. Friendships help to keep you moving forward. When those two marathon runners are in sync, they're pulling each other forward. When the leader gets tired, the other one steps up to take the pressure off the one who is struggling. His role is to keep him going. In the same way, in life, we need friends to help us when we're struggling, to keep us focused, to keep us moving forward. Best believe we all fall. No matter how self-reliant, how competent, and how capable you may be, you are not invincible. Sooner or later, something is going to knock you down. Or you might be in a difficult situation and you need that friend who comes through for you. And we will need our friends. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 10 says, if either of them fall down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Many times, it's not the significant life-altering catastrophes that cause the most harm, but rather the everyday letdowns, minor obstacles that accumulate over time and eventually, eventually push us towards hopelessness. That's why we require friends throughout our lives and not only during emergencies. I have a friend from my childhood days. I have a whole heap of friends, but I have a particular friend that has stuck with me was always been there for me and my family for as long as I can remember. And we communicate for prayer, to share success testimonies, to share the high and low moments. He and his family has always been there. Now I remember back in the day, my mother had to travel to Scotland for a few weeks. And those were the pre-cell phone days. And where I lived had no phone. So to get word, I had to go to my father's office in the morning. Remember, I'm living in the country. I have to come to town. I have to make the call. Because it's only daytime you can hear things. <clears throat> now, my friend was studying in England at the time. And he got word that my mother was visiting, going to Scotland. And he traveled up to Scotland and spent the weekend with my mother. And called me the Monday to tell me that she had settled and she was good. Friends like that are rare and priceless. Actually, when I was preparing this sermon and sharing it with my family, he called. And I said, boy, it's timely that you called. I was just talking to, you are my unnamed friend in my message. I have a lot of friends, you know. I have a lot of friends, a lot of good people who love me. I can tell you this, if I need a wrist, if I need a hand, 
And I said to Uncle Khalil, or Auntie Esther, I'm short of a hand. They'll give me. You understand what I'm saying? You can't pay for that, you know. That's priceless. That is priceless. In those times, when we feel like a failure or we can't move forward, that is when we need a true friend. Someone with an encouraging word, someone to ride out the storm with us. Solomon wrote, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can we keep warm alone? The idea here is that we need help from others to help us face circumstances that are beyond our control. We need emotional strength to get through the tough times and when we don't have enough of our own. Friendships provide emotional support. Friends are like a symbol of the love and affection that God has for us. And these two things are extremely important in our lives. For without love and affection, our lives can feel empty and dark the way to full. Friendships help you move forward and friendships keep you moving forward and they provide emotional support. And then, friendships protect you or your reputation. And we see this in verse 12. When this passage was written, almost all combat was hand-to-hand combat. Soldiers went into battle with a partner, someone, someone who could be counted on and trusted implicitly. Solomon borrowed the imagery of a battle when he wrote, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. These words were written based on the military strategy of the ancient world. Soldiers stood back to back with one another and they always kept their back in contact with each other and fought whatever enemy came from any side. A friend stands up and fights for the other when the situation demands it. Other person's reputation is important to them. True friends never stab you in the back. They guard your back. So true friendship demands that we watch each other's back. A real friend is someone who will fight to protect you or fight for your reputation. But hear this. Sometimes this fight to protect your reputation requires our friends to correct us. And that's a hot thing. You can be my friend, but don't correct me. A lot of us have that mindset. But we all have blind spots, and we don't see them. But the friends around us do. So please, receive correction wiser. Friendships mean being committed to helping each other win. True friends want to see us win and continue to grow. True biblical friends are always challenging each other and even pushing one another to be all that God wants. This ideal is reflected all through scripture. The phrase one another or each other is used more than 50 times in the New Testament, demonstrating the responsibility we have towards each other. For example, Galatians 6 and verse 2 says, carry every other burden, carry each other's burden. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Philippians 2 verse 4 says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. In a church community... This is the way we are to live, carrying each other when the other is in need. However, it only works when each of us are allowing others to know us and build relationships with us. It doesn't work any other way. 
We should not have expectation of each other when we are not building the foundation of friendship to allow the grace of God to flow through us. When you hear what friendship should provide in your life, you might be saying to yourself, I wish I had a friend like that. Well, you can if you have the right approach. Now, some of us have been taught from early, no, have no friend. Friends are not good. The very thing that the Bible teaches us that we need to have and we need to provide is the very thing that society teaches us and we don't need. So to be winning in 2024, we need to assess our current friendships. Since our success or failure in life is largely determined by the friends we keep, it makes sense that choosing the right friend is the first step towards achieving balance and fulfillment in life. It's no secret that toxic and unhealthy friendships can throw us off track and hinder our progress. Who we spend time with has a significant impact on who we become. It is important not to underestimate the influence of bad company on our lives. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, it says, Do not let anyone fool you. Bad people can make those who want to live good lives become bad. Therefore, it is crucial to evaluate our friendships and break off any toxic relationships that may be holding us back. I urge you to take some time this week to reflect on the friends, to assess the friends you have around in your life and make sure that they're helping you to grow and to thrive. Some of us are in toxic relationships because we're just plain lonely. Some of us pretend that we don't need relationships, but there's a craving inside of us for one. So we jump at anyone who, has, who is a little persistent and many times we rush in. And when they turn toxic, to caustic, we don't leave. We stay in abusive relationships because we'd rather feel the pain of abuse than the sting of loneliness. Then when it gets unbearable, we swear off relationships and isolate ourselves. And isolation is the worst thing to do. And we keep on, do this and keep on doing this and the cycle continues. What we need to learn is the art of building proper relationships. So we need to assess our current friends. And one of the questions you're answering is, how helpful is this relationship to your life? Are they helping you become the man and woman that God created you to be? Are they contributing positively to you winning in 2024? Are they helping you to grow? When your back is against a wall, can you count on them? If they are helpful and genuine, you want to look for ways to increase the time you spend with that person. So spend more time with those who are helpful. If there's someone in your life who is constantly putting you down and makes you feel worse about yourself, they may not be your best interest. They may not have your best interest at heart. Spending time with them may cause you to stray from the path that God has set for you. And they may not be the type of influence that pushes you towards becoming a better, more Christ-like person. So the only solution so these destructive friendships is spend limited time with those who are not a positive influence. When there's someone in your life that is tearing you down and moving you away from God's plan, you need to stop spending vast amounts of time with them. Make sense? As you think about your friends and how they measure up, we might need to start the process of getting new friends around us to move us into the winning direction. Now here at TLC, we encourage you to join life groups. 
We encourage you to get into discipleship groups or to join a ministry. And this is a great way to meet and interact with like-minded and godly persons. So we're going to look at some biblical factors that we can incorporate in choosing our friends. And the first one is choose carefully the process. Choose, choose carefully the process matters. The process of developing a friendship takes time. As we get to know other people, even in church, we have to assess them and not make assumptions. We're all a work in progress, including you. There are no perfect people here, including you. However, some people are more compatible with your personality and temperament. Take the time to find them. Proverbs 12, 26 says, The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the wicked, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. So you are giving your friends a seat at the table in your life. Now, since there are only a few seats that are close to you, be careful who you give those seats to. Remember, there are different levels of friendship. You have associates, you have casual friendships, you have close friendships. In picking our friends, we need to choose wisdom because their influence matters. Since your friends determine, determine as much as 95% of your success or failure, in life, then to win, I have to choose people who can help me get there. We all have to choose people who will make you better spiritually, better morally, better professionally, overall better. Proverbs 13 and verse 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. Since your friends will influence your life, look for friends who bring wisdom instead of foolishness to the table. Now, too many of us have foolish friends. And I'm the first one to put up my hand that I have had foolish friends in my life. And I use the friends, the word friends loosely in this instance. They know you're saved and are constantly trying to get you to slip back into the world. Making poor choices, hanging out with the wrong crowd, gossiping, it's time to cut loose. They are not adding value to your walk. I've had to make that decision at a point in my life. It was a very hard decision to make, but I knew that separation was necessary to ensure that I grew spiritually. So right about now, the Holy Spirit is bringing some names to your mind. Bear in mind though, not all friends are evil. Some friends are just not evil. But they're no longer growing in the same direction as you. In this instance, you may be growing apart, and that's okay. Some friends are only there for a season. In choosing friends, choose level-headed. Their demeanor matters. Proverbs 22, verses, Proverbs 22, reading from 24 to 25 says, Do not make friends with, with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. All I can say is, if a person is quick-tempered and flies off the handle easily, run. These are not friends you want in your life. Choose integrity. Their character matters. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11 says, But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually Im immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler, 
Do not even eat with such people. This goes back to influence. If you're around people who lack character, who lack integrity, it won't be long before they tempt you. And even expect you to fall in line. Avoid these people at all costs. So I believe that we have some decisions to make. We need to do some processing with the Lord. There are persons in our lives that we know shouldn't be there. There are persons that in our lives who have prominence and are sitting right at the table with us that we need to, we need to assess. They've held that position for too long. But if you're here today and you're not, you have not been a pay setter. Meaning that your life is not one that encourages persons to follow you as you follow Christ. In fact, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you're not in the race and you have not been living in purpose. God is calling you today. God is calling you to be a pace setter. To set the pace for others to follow you as you follow Christ. So if you want to follow Jesus today, or you wish to rededicate your life to Jesus, I'm going to be saying a prayer. And I'm encouraging you, if that is you, to repeat after me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins and surrender my life. Wash me clean. I believe that you, Jesus Christ, are the Son of God. That you died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again for my victory. I believe that in my heart, and I make this confession with my mouth, that you, Jesus, are my Savior and my Lord. Amen. Worship team, can you join me? So we've spoken about friendships today. If you need additional prayer, I'm going to be asking the altar workers if they can come forward. And there'll be somebody here at the altar willing and waiting to pray with you. So feel free to make your way to the altar. Thank you.